hi, and welcome to and or back to the Equithery podcast. I am your host, Jill Treese. And if you're new here or you are a longtime subscriber, um, this is happening. It's back. We're back. I'm back. <clears throat> so professional already. But listen, listen. If you're listening to this where you usually do on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, what have you, I want you to know. It is now available on YouTube in video form. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you're like, what on earth is going on? I subscribed for barn vlogs and miscellaneous horse videos and a little less cat walking in front of the camera. Um, <laughs> then, well, th things are changing, okay? And I'm going to get into all of that. So first, I just want to kind of reintroduce myself and the podcast because I think um, especially for those of you that might be watching this on YouTube and you aren't aware of the podcast then then you need this you do you need it in your life okay so um, what Equitheory is I, I am Jet Equitheory started out as Jill underscore heartthrob on Instagram and then went to Jill and Bo and then went to what was the next one Jet eventing because my initials are jet. If you didn't ever put that together, that is, th those are my initials. Um, and then once, you know, Zoe and I started changing our direction and I got more into positive reinforcement, having a sport in the title or my username didn't really feel super like authentic, if you will. So I was like, okay. We need to change this. So now I am Jet Equa Theory and Equa being equine and theory for learning theory and that I'm learning and that that's being a horse person, horse trainer in theory, all of those sorts of things. Um, so that's that's the story behind the name. And for the podcast, it went through several uh, name changes. Uh, I think it started out as equine in theory, which I'm kind of mad that I changed it, but also like, you know, branding. Um, and then it went to the Jet Real podcast, which was a play on Get Real. And then now it's, I think it's been Equitheory for, for like two seasons or so. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the Equitheory podcast. And what it is for those of you who are not familiar with the podcast is, well, historically it has been a deep dive sort of podcast into all things there's a fuzz on the mic uh training horses behavior management care just everything as well as b being a journey along with me as I learn and you know experience all of these things as an equestrian and just kind of your lay person's take on everything that I'm learning the science as well as the common traditional aspects of horse training and working and being with horses and enjoying them. Um, so I, I'm going to get a little bit more into the direction I'm wanting to take the podcast now, which if I was still doing seasons would be, I believe, season five. Um, but I went ahead and did away with the whole season thing just because it's easier to be like, we're on the 88th episode um, because I was not very uh, consistent <laughs> with um, how many episodes were in each season and it's just easier. So, um, this is episode 88 of the podcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you're like, where are the other ones? There is a YouTube playlist. Um, originally I had the Equitheory account on YouTube and I got rid of that because I was like, uh, don't, don't want a whole nother account where I have to deal with like, you have to get a certain amount of views before you make money. And I was like, I need this to be logistic and then I was like why why should I separate them Equi theory podcast stuttered um not stutter but you know I had a little brain pause um <laughs> but the podcast is really where I want to focus my attention and where I want to pour myself into and so that meant that I wasn't paying as much attention or being able to dedicate enough time on YouTube and I was like I just felt like I had so much and I'm going to get into a lot of that in this episode, I think. Um, but really I was like, you know, the podcast is something that I'm very proud of and I think a lot of people will enjoy. And I do still plan to do a lot of the traditional equestrian YouTuber content. 
um, and just also have the weekly podcast coming at you. So again, if you're new or you've been subscribed for a while and you're like, who is Jill at 22? I've been subscribed since she was 14 or 16, 19. Um, so Jill, 23 year old, did I say 22? I meant 23. Um, but I'm a 23 year old equestrian from Arkansas. I grew up in Little Rock and now I'm living in the Hot Springs area. It's about an hour away from my hometown. Really, really got far. Um, (laughs) But the reason I'm in Hot Springs is because I work and train on a horse farm where I board my horses. And I'm also in a graduate program. Originally, I moved up here for my undergrad that I got in psychology. Did that in three years. She's smart. Um, (laughs) And then... Um, I started the Masters of Clinical Mental Health Counseling program, so I'll have a Masters of Science here soon. The peace sign is my go-to, like, facetious attitude hand signal, but um, you'll get used to that. Or if you're listening, you don't have to deal with it, so good for you. Um, But if you are watching on YouTube, this will also be available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all of the places that you can listen to podcasts and I would really appreciate it since we've been on a hiatus if you wouldn't mind rating and reviewing that um that would be nice because (sighs) I've been gone for a while and we all know what that does to engagement but um yeah so basically that's it I was an eventer for a long time started riding when I was seven um and just fell in love with horses. Nobody in my family was really into horses. It's just for as long as I can remember, I've been fixated on them. And I finally, you know, grew up and did the thing and got to where I'm doing horses professionally. I work on a horse farm. I make money doing horse related activities. Um, And yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. There's an older episode of the podcast um, that you can find anywhere. I think it's called like turning your passion into your career or your job, should you, um, or horses making horse, something like that. Um, but that being said, uh, I have a lot of thoughts on it, but yeah, I'm coming at you guys again. Finally, it's, it's been a really long time since I did the podcast and I I've got some explaining to do. I realize. But basically, it's just all been this culmination and growing up, maturing, and then having a little bit of an identity crisis, like, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Should I be? Do I want to? And that's that's all what I'm planning on talking about in this episode. So if you're not really here for, like, just because you've been following me for a while or you're just, you listen to whatever episode of the podcast, um, this one might not be for you. And this 10 minute intro is probably all you need to understand that the podcast is chaotic. Um, I do have ADHD. Uh, recently got diagnosed with that like two years ago, I think. And so I'm a little bit all over the place, but you know what? I think it keeps it fun and authentic and you don't have to have to worry about whether or not I will be talking for a long time, because I can assure you that I can do it. I don't need another person. I have multiple three-hour episodes of this podcast. Um, So yeah, we'll just, I just kind of wanted the first episode to be casual and laid back because I just needed to do it. It has been a long time coming of buying the mic, the audio processor, the monitoring headphones, and like learning about all of this this podcasting stuff and doing it professionally to some extent. This is a home studio. Also, I moved. Um, So there's a lot of things that I want to talk about. And this episode is just going to be the intro to that. So if you're not particularly interested, you might just skip this one. And then I'm sure we'll be back on track next week talking about like specific horse things. Um, But yeah, I'm just planning on using this episode to, to update you all on what's been happening Um, be the first episode to YouTube and why it took so long (laughs) to come back and what I've been working on, what my plans are, what you can expect to come from Equitheory and me. Um, But yeah, let's just, let's jump into it. So I got some, some business updates and some like expectation type things that I kind of want to go over. And I have notes in front of me on a monitor. Um, So I, I'm I'm loving my setup. I spent far too much money for something that I wasn't sure if I was gonna do. 
Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to bring the podcast back and I wasn't sure how I was going to do it. If I was going to do it with video, if I was just going to do audio only like, and so, um, I, I got fixated on the planning side of things and I was like, I need all the equipment. And I got very like into the equipment, like I, I literally have an audio processor. And before I started, you know, doing this, I just had my little blue snowball USB plug-in mic and now I have an XLR mic and it is a dynamic mic I believe so you can't hear me when I'm talking over here and then it gets really loud right here um so it will be an adjustment to make sure that I'm talking directly into the mic okay little ASMR for you um but yeah so this is where we are so what's new we have so much so much has changed. It's it's all on the same platforms, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. TikTok is a new thing that I don't think I was doing when I had the podcast as much. And I'm not really doing it still because I am 40 years old in my brain. Um, not that there aren't 40-year-olds on TikTok, but I am. I feel like, like I just don't understand the kids these days <laughs> and I'm 23. Um, and that's probably because I live on a, a horse farm and talk to my dog and my cats and horses for the most part all day long. Um, but yeah, so this is where we're going. And if you're concerned about the YouTube channel, like I said, I still plan on doing the barn vlogs and some training videos and showing you guys like just what's going on, some peaceful horse girl content, okay? We're still doing all of that. Um, obviously no show vlogs or anything like that because I'm not really showing these days. If, if a horse comes along and my boss is like, I need you to get some show records, then that would be cool. But, um, you know, predominantly her personal (laughs) trainer, this is Zuko, my cat, um, her personal trainer flips horses a lot quicker than I am able to. And so you're just going to have to scooch, scooch on, scooch on out of the frame there. Getting boy. Okay. You can sit there. We're animal people on this podcast, so. You can just look at Zuko's crazy eyes. Can you, you don't need to be the center of attention. Um, But yeah, so uh, my boss's trainer is a lot speedier in that realm and it's what she does full time. So my boss often sends the horses that are like show prospects, more traditional that way. So um, for me, I tend to get the the long, (laughs) the ones that are going to be long clients. Zuko, you're just going to. There we go. Okay, he's off. Um, So anyway, the content will be here and it is also going to involve the podcast. And I hope that some of you are okay with that. And if you're not interested in the podcast, you don't got to watch. Please don't unsubscribe. Oh, my God. Um, (laughs) I've uh, just with taking the break and um, from the podcast and also from Instagram somewhat, I'm only posting like four or five times a week, which doesn't sound like a break. I think most people that have personal Instagram accounts that aren't dedicated to like horses maybe post once or twice every month. Um, And I am just like way in it. Um, So, you know, it, it, but it feels like a break for me because I am so used to posting seven days a week with like detailed captions and like edited photos. And it's just, it's a lot. And especially when I'm trying to develop, build, and live a life outside of all of this and, like, figure out who I am and what I want and all of that, it is has become a lot. But, um, yeah, so I've just backed off a little bit, but I'm not quitting. So I'm going to keep forging ahead. Um, and so with that, I was like, okay, what do I want with the podcast and all of this? And I decided that I want the podcast to be my main focus and all the other social media can be there to serve as like a blog vlog sort of thing you know just posting and keeping it low-key and low stress for me because um there were some some times uh some month-long periods that I just I couldn't exist beyond the bare minimum and I still don't know that I would say that I'm fully past that, but it, it has gotten a lot better. And, um, you know, I was like, what do I want? Do I want to do this anymore? Um, 
and finally settled on the path forward and am stressed currently that I'm being so redundant, but I'm trying to keep my train of thought together. It's very distracting to be on video now, um, but I'll adjust. I'll get used to it. Um, but yeah, so I, I decided that in order to bring everything back and to to just kind of like mark a, a difference, uh, that it was time to do a rebrand. And so I partnered with Farm and Fur Co. Um, you can find them on Instagram uh, or their website. And that's Tara. I'm not sure everybody on the team, but I worked with Tara and Ashley. And Ashley's a graphic designer at White Stallion Studio on Instagram. If you want to check out her stuff, I absolutely fell in love with it. She worked on a lot of projects uh, for other horse people that I know. And I <laughs> loved their stuff and was like, I need that that's what I want and so I went ahead and reached out to them and we're working it out so you'll be hearing some ads for them soon but they did an absolutely amazing job I'm you're gonna have to get off the table um working with me because I am oh my god now he's eating a receipt oh and there goes my whole table stop cats don't interact with me all day long and then the second I'm trying to do something productive they're like let's make noise um, anyway, so I, I'm very picky and I told them frequently that I am probably the most annoying client because I am an artist. These are, these are all done by me. Um, and I know very well what I don't want. However, I do not know what I'm looking for and what I want in a logo and like design and stuff like that. I'm terrible at design. That's why most of my pieces are centered or there's this big gray blob cloud because my art teacher insisted that I do a background and I was like, what? Ah! <sighs> he just jumped and clawed onto my arm. This is going to be a problem. I think, um, I would love to lock the cats out of the office while I'm doing this, but they will just bang on the door. Um, so now they're both in here. Oh, good. Um, anyway, let's stay on topic a little bit, maybe once that never happens. If you expect that out of this podcast, you, you need a more structured one because I entertained the idea of doing segments and I might, I might do some segments here and there, but, um, for the most part, I think I just, I, I do best just riffing, you know? Um, but yeah, so we did the rebrand and the logo came out beautiful. I absolutely love it. It's Zoe and Azula and they they look like Zoe and Azula and that's what really mattered to me because I think um, what's awesome about working with horse people that are into graphic design and website design, marketing, business type stuff um, is that they, they know equestrians whereas um, some other graphic designers that I've tried to work with in the past um, – you know, that you guys have never seen because it didn't make it to the final product is because they, they were drawing a horse. They were not drawing Zoe. And I'm very picky because I have the artist eye, not to be arrogant, but like, it is good. Um, <laughs> I'm very proud of my art. I think it's fun. Um, but I never have time to do it. I wish I did. Um, maybe someday. But yeah, so I really just wanted something that kind of got the connection aspect and having the two of them together is awesome and it's very hard to do horse logos without being like way cheesy so I'm I'm really excited with how it turned out and I think it looks great and I love the font of the logo I'm very into like the art deco maybe or like modern twist on 70s things I mean look at my curtains here like and I also have a bookshelf full of horse training books this shelf is specifically dedicated to horse books um and I tried to set up the camera situation to where you could see it it's just it's not possible and I don't really want to put my bookshelf right in front of the window so it is what it is but uh also filming on an iPad uh none of my cameras shoot in high enough resolution or for long enough so you know that might change so this is this is a test run if you will but um you know, that's, that's where I'm at because it took me so long to get going and to get everything together, but it was just, I'm a perfectionist and I ended up procrastinating because I was like, I need to get 
you know, all the equipment first. I need to get the rebrand completely done and finalized. And I need to do like, and then it just kept putting off longer and longer and longer. I plan to bring the podcast back in November of 2021. It is what, April of 2022, I think. That's my hair. Um, And like, I, it just didn't happen. And so we're here now. I'm doing it. And there, there's so much that I want to do still. I have a lot of ideas for like products that I want to put out. I'm doing like your basic YouTuber, podcaster merch. Um, that'll be pretty simple. I mean, hopefully, uh, you know, I have an iPad now, which I'm very excited about digital planning. Whoop, whoop. Uh, <laughs> I got really into bullet journaling and it helps me keep the ADHD brain going in the right direction somewhat. And I got into digital planning because eco-friendly trying to be, I don't know if it offsets with like having a technology device, but that's what I'm doing. Uh, and so I'd like to take some of my artistry and put it into like procreate and design some cool merch. Um, but I haven't quite worked out all the kinks on, there's a learning curve on procreate for sure. And so I've got to get that figured out, but for now it'll just be the logo and a way to support me and the podcast if you're interested I'll have it um linked down below next week maybe if I remember if not you can find it on my website or in my Instagram you'll find it somewhere um and it'll be linked in every episode after but um yeah so that's something that I want to do but beyond that I also have a lot of ideas since I'm so into planning and like journaling and logging and things like that, that I want to be able to make some of those that are horse centric and equestrian oriented for you guys. Um, some printables, some digital things like that. Um, and just, just have something else going, you know, I think it could be fun. Um, but yeah, the, on that, I mentioned my website, which is completely redone all new. Some of the pages I I haven't like fully like done a website audit because there is so much, but, um, the color scheme is updated. A lot of the pictures are updated. The, I had to learn to code for the font, um, and learn. I use liberally. Uh, I didn't actually have to learn to code, but I did have to do a lot of Googling and also to work all of this equipment because this is above my pay grade. Um, but with the the website, there are the equine edu pages, the topics pages are really fleshed out now. There's a lot of information on there. I'm updating them all the time. So if you're interested in learning about shivers or nutrition or hoof care or anxiety or positive reinforcement, there's a whole page dedicated, a whole multiple pages dedicated to positive reinforcement. Um, but the equine edu page is all about just different topics that, you know, maybe I've gone over on the podcast or, um, clients have asked me about, and I've had to do research and I'll just slap it together on the page, um, for other people. I really appreciate lists and having everything in one place when I'm looking for something like with Zoe's kissing spine rehab. I think that was really the reason that I started doing the resource hub pages because, um, it was, it was frustrating to me that I would get so many DMs and people would be like, my horse is girthy, my horse is biting or doing this. And I would send them resources, but I'd have to go get them every time. So just having it all in one place seems easier. And also for people that are Googling, you can just find it, be like, what is kissing spine? And then, you know, if my SEO is good, my search engine optimization, if it's good, um, <laughs> it should pop up so you can have all of those resources right there for you. Um, even though I have been reading some more about kissing spine lately and I'm kind of, it just seems like I'm always in a, a learning state of mind and constantly like, did I do the right thing? Is that right? But that's for another episode. Um, but yeah, so last things on the like businessy update type things is, um, the Patreon. So I'm not going to give you a full ad here. But the Patreon used to be really complicated, and I offered training tiers and things like that. Um, But I ended up feeling like I was just letting a bunch of people down and that I was just taking their money, Um, and I don't enjoy that. And it's because I have a really bad habit of people-pleasing. And, well, we won't say really bad habit, but... um, 
an outdated coping mechanism, if you will, uh, that I don't need to do anymore as an adult. I don't need to people please uh, and say yes to literally everyone and everything and be just omniscient for everyone else. Uh, I would like to focus my attention and be really good in one area rather than be like 30% good in a bunch of areas because I just ended up letting a lot of people down and not fulfilling and uh, just looking at other people in the space that are doing so much so well I was like oh well I need to be doing all of that too and like what I came to realize is that I am in a master's program and I am studying for clinical mental health counseling I am horse training on the side And I'm also doing all of the social media stuff and also at some point need to find time to eat or sleep or have a social life, Um, you know, things like that. So it was really easy for me to do all of that when I was going through a breakup and needed a distraction, uh, like, was that two, three years ago now? Um, And now I'm in a, a very healthy relationship. I'm in a really good place and I want to be able to enjoy my life and not be worried about how I'm capturing it so that I can Photoshop it onto Instagram. You know, I actually don't know how to work Photoshop at all. And I refuse to pay for an Adobe subscription. So we use the paid Lightroom app to edit and after light two on iOS devices. I don't know if it's on Android, but there's a freebie for you if you were interested in how I edit my pictures. Not well, I think. Um, but it is the way that I do it. So, um, Anyway, so the Patreon is a place that if you want, you can support. Uh, I offer three different tiers at the moment. The first tier is just a $1 a month subscription. My face is getting a little blown out there. Maybe we can turn that down. Yeah. Um, So it's just a $1 a month subscription if you want to support me and the podcast in a small way. Anything helps. And um, then at the $5 tier, which is the second tier... You are an equitherist light. Um, so not alcoholic, believe it or not. Um, but now it's bothering me that it's, okay, just auto. Uh, yeah, so at the $5 tier, you can um, get access to the Equithery Discord server. So what that means is you'll have Discord access to a private server where Everybody else is a patron or was at one point. You can also cancel after the first month if you want, and you'll still have access to the server. Um, But what that does is it just allows you to have all of, like we have a bunch of different channels within the server um, for nutrition or book recommendations. And it's where everyone can kind of come together and share their thoughts, ideas, things that they're seeing, make discussions. Um, There's a podcast section on there as well where you can suggest topics or ask questions that maybe I'll cover on the episode and I can pull you guys for like what you want to see on the podcast. Um, So if you're interested in doing that, it's $5 and then you're on the server um, and you can choose to keep supporting or you can drop out. Whatever works for you, it's all good. Um, And then at the $10 tier, you also have that access. Um, But on top of that, I host monthly live meetings over Discord. Uh, it's like a Zoom setup. We can all see each other. We can all hear each other or you can turn your mic off, whatever. Um, and they, <laughs> they're really fun, honestly. Um, and they're fun for me too, which is why I've kept it because it, it allows me to connect with you guys better on a one-on-one kind of basis. They usually go for like three hours. I'm trying to max it at three hours because we've gone for like four hours and it's, it's too much. Um, but I ask, uh, the server patrons, the equitherists, that's what they'll say. That's what you are at that tier, um, to bring questions, uh, or discussion topics. And then we go over that. And usually the meetings sort of devolve into us just talking about being equestrians or being humans and just, go into life things and it's really fun and it's it's very low-key laid back um I've been in a lot of zoom meetings in a professional capacity that it's like it's very I am the trainer and you are the client and uh I thought that's what I should be doing but I am kind of taking a step back from that so we'll get into the life updates and where I went now in this segment 
So the reason for the lead in to this one is because I mentioned with Patreon um, that I am scaling back from the professional capacity so much um, because of what I'm getting into now, which is the life updates and like why I've been gone for so long section. And I, I, I don't really know why exactly I feel the need to talk about this. And maybe it's just because I'm self-important um, or maybe it's because I want to be relatable in some capacity and I hope that it is relatable so you also get something out of it. Um, but really, like, there has just been so much change over the past year. Um, really, it's almost been a year that I've been gone from the podcast. Um, so much has changed. We moved farms. So we were about an hour away at our old farm that's been in all the videos. And now we're at this amazing, amazing place. And it, it, it sounded so good <laughs> at the beginning. And it is. It really is. It's such a dream to be living here and working here and get to use this facility. But at the same time, like the other day, um, a rando, if you will, pulled up and he was like, oh, I know. I know you guys and I was driving by and I saw the jumps out and I was just wondering when you guys are having shows. It's so beautiful. I'd love to live here. It's so peaceful and just listening to the crickets and the ducks. And I'm like, see, you get to look around and you get to go, what a beautiful place. It's so peaceful here. And I'm like, I look around and I see unfinished projects and stress like, oh, there's so much that we have had to revamp and like patch and build. And it has been a very long process and that's that's me moving myself in and getting settled aside and like dealing with my life outside of that and you know I'm I'm moving up in my graduate program so it, it got really demanding uh in the past couple of semesters uh this semester has been really easy actually but this fall I start practicum which means I will have to actually go and get work experience and log hours and things like that and then uh, in the spring of 23 and the fall of 23, I'll be doing internship one and then internship two, where I will be working, <laughs> which is terrifying, but also awesome. Like, that's what I've been doing this whole program for. And um, it's so weird to have like two very different, but also very connected career paths going for me. And like I said, with so much change, there's been a lot of necessary self evaluation, personal reflection and like goal analysis and I've like really had to evaluate a lot lately. Um, you know, the move was a huge change and because this farm only has three big fields, uh we had to downsize and that was very stressful trying to rehome a lot of our horses and I honestly can't believe we did it as well as we did. We ensured that none of our horses went to any bad situations. They all went to very loving and hopeful homes. A lot of them went to therapy centers and things like that. Um, and it was, it's crazy because most of them are retirees or, you know, have some arthritis or ailment. And like, that's what 90% of our farm is anyway. Uh, I think we only have like four young ones. Yeah. Dexter, Astro, Azula, and Simba. Um, and everybody else is like 10 plus. <laughs> so, uh, and the ones that are in their elder years, we we kept a lot of the, like, you know, the, the senior citizens because um, they're ours. And it's, it's scary to send senior horses somewhere else. And it was scary to bring them here because we were like, they've lived at Bismarck for a long time and now we're gone. So, but everybody did super well. The trailering and moving everybody here like went shockingly smoothly. We didn't have any trouble with that. And so many horses struggle with trailering problems. And it was just crazy that these horses that had been on that farm for over 10 years hadn't ever left. Uh, we're just like, okay, here we go. Um, which is just awesome and a load off, but um, so there's that. And it's just, I can't emphasize enough how much it has been. And I was feeding for a long time before we got everybody moved because like everybody had to move. And, um, so I, I've just had a lot of responsibilities that fall outside of riding and training and more managerial 
caretaking type roles. And so now, now we're here and everything is pretty well settled. We've got the arena built. All that's left is to put a fence around it. We got all the jump set up and I'm looking at it right now and they all keep blowing over. Oh my God. <laughs> they just refuse to stay upright. Gonna have to get sandbags. But um, yeah, so basically that is a long-winded way of saying Basically, that is a long-winded way of saying that I, for a long time now, for the past year pretty much, have been pulled in so many different directions. Graduate student, social media, influencer, personality, persona, whatever, uh, horse trainer, locally, online, for my boss, for me, my personal horses, um, trying to, you know, be in a relationship and like master's program Hmm. so like I got really 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 burnt out a lot of the things that I was doing I started during COVID because I was coming out of a breakup like I said and um, during the pandemic it was like oh my god I have so much free time I live by myself on a horse farm and I don't have you know anything to do all my school's online now so I can just zip through that. And now I can do all of those things that I wasn't able to do before. And look how many projects I can create because self-worth is obviously measured via how much output you have and how much productivity you have. And I really, really fell into the American dream of just work myself to death. And I burnt out really hard, crashed and burned and was unable to do anything beyond the bare minimum for like a solid six months until I really reset. And I still feel like I'm in that a little bit. Uh, Like I said, this podcast, it's taken a really long time to come back to because there was just so much I had to think about and had to consider and evaluate. And now I'm here and it's, it's like, like I just really decided that this is the thing that I enjoy the most out of all the social media stuff that I do. So I can, I can keep doing it. I don't have to feel like I have been posting on Instagram and YouTube for years for no reason. And I actually enjoy the podcast. And that's not to say I don't enjoy YouTube and Instagram, but it just, it just doesn't feel the same as it used to. And I lost a little bit of that creative spark for it that I still have for the podcast because I can just talk and I I really enjoy it. And, you know, again, not everybody needs a podcast. And just because you can sit and record yourself for multiple hours on end, talking to no one in particular doesn't mean that you need a podcast. Um, But I do, I do feel like this podcast is unique in that it is, it's just very low effort while being super high effort at the same time because it's it's just I like it to feel like it flows and like it would be something that I would listen to and that's a big reason that I decided to bring it to YouTube because a lot of my podcast listening goes on in my car or when I'm cleaning stalls or when I'm you know working or doing something that doesn't involve my full attention and I would like to be entertained in some capacity Um, but also when I'm when I'm like designing a planner or working on something kind of tedious that I don't really need my full attention on, I like to just have a podcast on a video in the background and I can look over every now and again, but it doesn't require me to stare at it like a lot of times TV shows do. Not to mention I've completely burned through all of every streaming platforms category or uh, catalogs. Um, So that's why I decided to do it like this and also transparently it is a way for me to make money on YouTube and to keep my YouTube channel alive and still something that people can come to and don't have to be like oh that died because it's so disappointing to me that so many of the YouTubers I grew up on even though 90% of them are now problematic and I see so so clearly why they are problematic um, but a lot of them quit like I grew up on Jenna Marbles like my videos in the very beginning of the Jet Equithera YouTube channel. Uh, I'm talking LinkedIn the whole time because all I watched was Jenna Marbles. And, um, you know, it's just, it's sad to see your favorite creators just disappear. And some of them needed to go. (laughs) But others, you know, I'm like, oh, they just, or some of them just grew out of it. And they're like, this isn't for me anymore. I don't want to be on social media. I want to have a life. 
and not just be constantly focused on numbers and growing and filming and stressing about um, all of the demands. And, you know, it, it's an amazing career field to be in, especially to like get lucky enough to be semi successful at it. Um, but at the same time, it is it is not a nine to five. It this doing this, even at the small capacity that I'm doing it, you know, I'm not a, a giant podcast or a giant Instagram, YouTube channel or whatever, but it is a full time job. I think about it constantly. I am constantly like, oh, I need to respond to that DM. I need to look at those comments. I need to answer these emails. I have these brand deals. I have obligations. I I need to film. I need to record this. I, I need to wear this thing this day so I can get pictures of it and edit it. And like it it is just constant in my brain and it's exhausting. So um, that's, that's why uh, the evaluation that I keep talking about, I really had to sit down with myself over multiple, multiple months and going over it. And there was a long period there where I was like, there's nothing I can do. I, I just have to keep doing it. And it's going to be hard and exhausting. And I don't really want to anymore. But I work so hard for this. And what if I what if I come back to it? Because my motivation and my passions come in waves. Uh, and I think a lot of horse people can relate to that with horses. There are just, you know, a couple months or maybe even years that you're just like, I don't really feel like doing the horse thing anymore. And then if you stick it out somewhere along the way, that passion just kicks back on and you're like, oh, I'm so glad I did not quit. Um, and so that's a big reason why I was like, I, I can't give this up because I, I know myself <laughs> and I know that uh, these things come and go for me. And if I, when I have taken breaks in the past, I have kicked myself for the the loss of engagement. Like my Instagram has been on a steady, steady, low death. Um, I think I was at 89.9 K at one point, so close to 90 K. And I think I'm at like 83 two, I think when I checked it this morning, not the number specifically, but I do see my own profile when I post things. Um, and so it's, it's just been steadily dying. I lose about a hundred followers a week. It's pretty lit. Love it. Um, but you know, at some point I was like, you know, why am I doing this? I don't care about it anymore and nobody else really seems to either. So why am I doing this? And I just, I don't know how many different ways I can say it and I probably should stop. Uh, but I just decided that I really do love the podcast and I don't want to give it up. And I do enjoy sharing my life and my horses and the things that I learn and trying to be a positive voice in the horse world where like, especially on TikTok, oh my God, the amount of times I think my eyebrows are going to fly off my face at videos I see, like I intentionally stay away from horse TikTok. I post my videos and then I go back to cat videos or like DIY tips and things. Um, but I just, there's, there's so much negativity in the horse world. And I'm not talking about like equestrian on equestrian, you know, hate over the internet that's to be expected and has been around forever and it sucks but um the what i'm talking about is like just the blatant violence and abuse towards horses and normalizing it justifying it and to anyone else that thinks that maybe we shouldn't beat horses as a method of teaching um like that you're automatically a tiktok trainer or a you know treat dispenser or some other belittling term, um, when it's, it's like, I just, I would like to be a voice of opposition toward all of that, not in the like retaliating with violence category, but just being like, you don't know any better. And I know that you think you do because I was there too. I grew up very traditionally. I did a lot of things that I would never dream of doing to horses now. And, um, I justified it and I argued with people like me now <laughs> and I was like you're you're just too soft you're you whatever like it's a horse it can handle it they do it to each other like all of that and now um now I would like to for those that are interested and would like to hear something else you know to be somewhere that they could get that you know um and I'm not out here to like change everybody's perspective and mind on everything, but just 
you know, present a different perspective for those who, who would like to be heard in that capacity or who are open or exploring. Um, and with all of that said, like, that's, that's where I mentioned earlier on the podcast with the professional label is, is a really hard one for me because it's like, I found positive reinforcement. I dove headfirst into it, uh, way hyper fixated on it. It was something that I was very passionate about and I wanted to talk about and share it. I was like, why is nobody else talking about this? And I like, I think that I really did make a positive impact on the horse world and bringing positive reinforcement to the forefront. I was one of the major voices in bringing it to social media and talking about it and making a fuss about it and making everyone hate me (laughs) in the process because I went very purist at the beginning. Um, But now I, I'm kind of in this state where I'm like, I came into this really hot and heavy and really fast and like full steam ahead, full send. I, I was like, I'm a positive reinforcement trainer. That's what I'm doing. And then I got good at it. And then people started asking me for advice. And I realized that I am a good problem solver. And I know the principles and I can help people with this. And um, I got the experience working with my horses and local horses and my boss's horses. And not that's not to say that I think I'm like this high and mighty thing. That's actually what I'm getting to is that it feels almost too soon. Uh, I keep thinking about applying for my horse behavior consultant uh, certification through IAABC, International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. Um, But I I just don't know that this is what I want to do. Because like I mentioned in that episode about making your passion your career, um, when you take something that is intrinsically motivating and intrinsically fun and something that you love and you you give it monetization and external validation, it becomes intrinsically motivated. And then all of a sudden you're working with horses and training horses to help their owners, to please their owners, to make money and to fill a quota. And it it loses that like authentic authenticity and that like intrinsic drive and just love for the sake of doing it. And that is a lot of what I have lost. And another big reason that I wasn't super into the podcast or posting on social media much is because I wasn't working with any of the horses. I was moving and doing a bunch of other things. Um, So the best I could provide was a picture of my horses in the field um, or the occasional ride. And um, it just, it lost the spark because it wasn't about connecting with horses anymore. It wasn't about, you know, trying to make their lives better or (laughs) to accomplish something. Um, It was just for the sake of like, this is my job now and I need to get this done. And my personal horses got put on the back burner and it made it very hard to want to do anything with them. And I imagine it's kind of like if you drive cars for a living, like if you're an Uber driver or you drive a semi or something like that, then it is very difficult to want to go on a road trip for fun because you're like, I drive all the time. I don't want to do this. Um, so that's sort of what it became for me um, and made it really difficult to want to talk about it and be involved in it in another capacity that felt like work. And I understand that that is a very privileged perspective to have that like, God forbid anything I do feel like work, but like I was working very hard and did not want to add more work on top of it. And so with all of that, I was like, okay, I'm in a position where I am able to evaluate my life and what I want for my life and I can do something about it. I don't have to live this, this stressed out, burnt out, just running myself ragged life if I don't want to. I can do something about it. Everything I'm learning in my graduate program is all about helping other people live their best life and find fulfillment and, you know, transcend authentically and, you know, lead a life that they would want to. And even if it doesn't mean that they're doing everything necessarily that they want, but to find 
some joy and some pleasure, gratification, whatever, um, in what they're doing, even if they have to do it and it's not necessarily what they want to do. Um, so (laughs) my cat is just insistent that he be on the table. Please get off the table. Don't fight it. Um, so I was like, why can't I apply that to myself? It, it literally, and what we are taught in being a counselor in a professional capacity is that you are not like it is, you are being unethical if you are not taking care of yourself, if you're not practicing self care, and if you are not prioritizing yourself for at least part of your day, you are being unethical. You cannot fill another's cup if you are not filling your own. So uh, I have really started to take that to heart because at the beginning I was like, mm, I'll be fine. Uh, and then I saw what happens. My health seriously declined and I felt like crap. I was acting not like a good person. I was resentful of the horses and work and school and just everything I had to do. I just, everything sucked and I had a terrible outlook on it. And it was because I I wasn't doing anything for the right reasons anymore. And it just felt like I was being pulled and dragged along and my fingers dug into the floorboards as I'm being pulled by my foot you know like it's just what it felt like and I it took a long down period of me not being able to do anything um a depression if you will uh that I was able to really start evaluating everything once I had the energy it was like okay something has got to give here I don't want to live like this and I'm 23 and this is supposed to be the best years of my life and I feel like I am moments away from simply passing away because I like I'm not fueling my body I'm not taking care of myself and I'm suffering and um, I think you can see that in the acne that I'm dealing with it's you probably I don't know how well you can see under the makeup but uh, when I don't have makeup on, I look like a extra meaty pizza. So love that visual. But yeah, so anyway, that that's a long way of saying that I decided that I want better for myself and that I can make things better for myself and I can achieve that if I want to. And I still struggle to talk about it and say that without feeling super guilty and like bad that I like if I'm tired and I physically can't go on anymore that I'm doing something right because I have been so productive that I physically can't give anymore and then I'll wake up and do it again the next day. Um, That is if I sleep. And so like it's just that's no way to live. It really isn't. And uh, I don't expect that out of other people. And I don't expect that out of the horses. I don't want that for other people. In fact, the whole profession that I'm going into is helping people get out of that. And I had to do that for myself. So yeah, it has been a long, hard, arduous process of trying to evaluate that and get over some of the, the guilt I felt for you know, prioritizing myself in the smallest ways, you know, um, it it just, it felt wrong to, to be like, no, I'm going to do this for me actually, or I'm going to say no to that because I actually don't want to do it. Um, because historically I just say yes, whatever makes everybody else happy and makes me feel like I'm good enough and I'm doing enough. Um, I say yes. And I don't want that anymore. Um, because as we have learned in horse training, if you don't respect the no, are you actually getting a real consenting yes? Do you have a willing participant or are they just afraid of the potential negative repercussions? And so that's, that's really what I went through was like, how can I have enough respect and love for myself in the same way that I want for other people and other sentient creatures? Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's been a long process. It's, I've been to a lot of doctors trying to figure out, um, why my health was so terrible and turns out that, um, among some more personal things that, um, my cortisol levels were just through the roof and I was just in a state of chronic stress and chronic inflammation 
and my body just was like can't do it anymore you're killing us stop (laughs) so that's that's what I'm doing I'm stopping you got me (laughs) thank you body for insisting um but there was also a lot um going on throughout the year we lost a lot of horses like I mean not a lot but like we lost Ben and uh that one's still still hard to talk about um you know, I, I made a post about it. If you're out of the loop, you can look up uh, Unbinded IPC, I believe, um, on my Instagram. But that was really, really hard. And uh, we lost Ghosty before that. And it's just it just feels like everyone and everything around me is dying. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, how do I deal with this? And so that was another element that was playing into all of the things that went into the break and then Zoe's rehab um, that I just have not made any progress on. I will say that her top line looks great. She's a very healthy weight. Her feet are impeccable. Her body condition, like she just looks like a different horse. Her thoracic sling and her chest area, she she used to stand like very base narrow and um, didn't have much of a chest And now that she's been out of work for so long and after the surgery, like she is a hoss, like she is a big wide girl now. And I've learned a lot about that as well, that uh, that's really indicative of better posture and um, greater sign of health. But again, like we did the kissing spine surgery and since like before I did it, I did so much research and it really seemed like the surgery was the best option. And now it's, that was in, was that last year? I think it was last year. Yeah, towards the end of last year. Um, Now, since then, I've seen a lot coming out about why that might not be the best option. And before I like really talk on that, I'm going to have to do some more research. But um, I've seen some posts that have really made me consider and think about it. Um, And I don't, I don't know what to do. But um you know, the timeline on the rehab was like, I forget, I don't want to give the wrong timeline, but it was pretty fast that you were, you burn through the groundwork and do it right, do it well. And then you can get on within like this crazy, crazy quick timeline. And to me, I was like, I don't really think I want to be sitting on a recently surgically operated on back after like, I think I want to say it was 90 days, but I really can't remember. Um, I, I, I talk about it in the podcast and videos that I did about it, but, um, I can't remember exactly what the timeline was, but all that to say, I didn't feel super good about that. So I wasn't really in a hurry. And on one hand, I know that you're supposed to do all of this corrective groundwork to help the spine, you know, spread and elongate and those spinal processes to widen, um, even though the surgery does that artificially, you're supposed to aid that with proper strength and conditioning and training. However, I will say Zoe being turned out, I have seen a massive, massive difference in her. She's outside 24 seven and has been for multiple years now, but, um, there's a lot of terrain, a lot of like hilly up and down, um, lots of rocks and things like that, that she has to deal with tree branches, ponds, and there's all sorts of stuff in her field that she encounters and proprioceptively, is that a word? From a proprioceptive uh, standpoint, that's really, really amazing for horses and helping them learn to use their bodies in a healthy, more natural way. And every time I rode her, I mean, you can go back and watch the videos. She is so hollow. It's no wonder that those dorsal spinous processes were like all together because her back was a U, an a banana, like she just was a bad banana, you know, and not bad in the sense that she was like being bad, but um, biomechanically speaking, bad, uh, very unhealthy way to go. And it's because I had terribly fitting saddles and uh, the training was not good for her. It made her very, very stressed and anxious all the time. And so now we're at this place where she's she's just being a horse and I feel really guilty for not having done the rehab one there was zero time and two I didn't 
really feel like super good about it. And I have a book on my shelf called Core Conditioning for Horses by Visconti Simon Cocosa, maybe? Maybe. Um, you can find it on Amazon if you're interested in it. Whether your horse has kissing spine or not, you need that book and you need to do it um, because it is awesome and is what every everybody recommends for like helping a horse build their core and be able to lift over their back and preventative for kissing spine as well as like the rehab backside. But um, with Zoe, uh, you know, I just think it's been really good for her. And part of me is like, I, I really think she's okay. She seems happier than ever and more comfortable, more confident. Her back is loose and it's not like rigid. It used to feel like this tabletop here. And now it's like springy and squishy, like a cushion. And, um, she just looks stronger and healthier. And so it's not been at the top of my priority list. And I, part of me is aware that the rehab protocols are for people that want to ride their horses. So it's like, you need to do this so you can ride. And, um, I don't know how much of that is health maintenance and I feel irresponsible and like a terrible horse mom. So please don't hate on me. Um, ha ha. Don't send me bad things. If you have information on it or you found a resource um, on that, um, send it my way. But also probably just going to stress me out <laughs> um, because I like the other thing is like as somebody that has become a more progressive horse trainer that is rooted in science, um, when the horse doesn't want to participate anymore, it's very hard to demand that they do. And with Zoe, it's not that she is giving me a hard no, but it's, it's more of a, she could go either way. She doesn't really care to participate and to train and to do all of this stuff anymore. And, you know, I mean, maybe next month that'll change or maybe next year she'll, she'll feel differently. But right now she just seems very content and to be enjoying her life as a horse. And, she just, she gave me so much of herself, her body, her health. I mean, like, obviously she's a horse and didn't necessarily have a choice, but I feel like that gives me even more reason. Like she could have seriously injured me with how much I was putting her through and probably should have. Um, but Zoe hardly ever threw a buck. The most she did was she just went around tense and, unver and inverted. And so like, I, I just, she has a heart of gold and is so honest and took me up the levels and it was just, she's just an incredible partner and an incredible teacher. And I don't, like if she's not asking to interact and to train and to go and do, like, I'm not really super concerned about doing it. Um, especially since the next phase of this is that I bought Azula <laughs> and everybody on YouTube you should know that by now, uh, because I said, meet my new horse, or I bought a filly or something. Um, clickbaity. But uh, I did. I bought Azula. She is no longer going to be a race pony. She is mine. And uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But I have, I can safely say that I could probably talk for three hours about Azula and just how amazing she is. And I, I might sometime do like an Azula episode. But Azula is like, it doesn't matter if I'm training her. And she's been on the same pro program as about everybody else. She has not been handled much. I feel like a very bad trainer um, and young horse owner that she's just been kicked out in the field. Um, she knows how to pick up her feet and she knows how to lead. So <laughs> she trailers pretty well. So I'm like, eh, she's good. She's two years old. She knows what she needs to for the moment. And so... It hasn't been like a super big priority for me to like, you know, have her going and doing. And that's that's really hard in the horse world because like there's such a pressure to to have something to show for it. You know, like with Zoe, like we did the kissing spine surgery. OK, when are you riding? When are you showing again? When are you going to be jumping? Are you going to like why can't she just live in a field and be happy being a horse? Because I think if I could ask her, she would be like positive reinforcement training school. I enjoy the clicker training stuff. Also don't want to leave my mom in the field. Uh, she's out in the pasture with her half blind mother, Amber. Uh, Amber is missing an eyeball on her left side, I believe. Um, 
and her and Zoe are very, very connected and they have this little thing that they do and it's it's very unique to them and please let me know if if you have horses that do this but it's very consistent and anytime they get worried about something or there's something off in the distance when they start to relax they me and my boss call it booping they boop each other with their noses they'll just turn and touch the other's chest and they like one will do it zoe will do it to amber and then amber does it back it's it's a very like cool thing to witness how connected they are and they're checking on each other and they're like, I'm here, I've got you. And um, maybe a little anthropomorphic, maybe not. I don't know. But it, I just, I struggle to be like demanding the Zoe's attention and like all of this stuff from her so that I can post on social media about it. Like she doesn't care. <laughs> she is very happy to be living her best life in the field. Like when I walk out in the field, she picks her head up and she acknowledges and regards me. And she's happy for me to come over and scratch her and brush her. But she she usually ends up leaving. And uh, not in like a pinning ears, you know, pissy type of way, but more that she's like, okay, I'm done now. I'd like to go graze. And it's it's very clear. It's very polite. And it just feels amicable. And that like we've we've both just kind of been like we we have done what we needed to do. I don't know if that makes sense or if that's like really sad to hear. But um, for me, it's very liberating and very nice. And it could be that it's liberating to me for me to perceive it that way. But um, there is a very clear difference between Zoe, this horse that is was she 11 now? And I've been working with her since she was three. We have trauma bonded and we have shared life together. She led me to positive reinforcement. And like she she just gave me so much of herself and so much education and invaluable priceless experiences. Like I, I, I genuinely can't repay it if I tried. And she just like... The other horses in the field that I have hardly anything to do with always come up and are like, what's up? And then they usually are like, okay, you don't have like snacks or scratches. Peace. Um, But Zoe almost never really walks up to me anymore. And uh, she does on occasion. And then I I get her good itchy spots and she gets her lip going. And then she like sets her eyes on the distance and walks on. And it's just like, just like having coffee with an old friend, you know, that it's just like kind of that impassing thing. And it, it does make me sad to think about because we've just been through so much together. But at the same time, like, I, I do have to respect that it doesn't seem like she's not into it anymore. And I don't think it's, you know, because I'm not doing enough, or I haven't created enough of a positive association, like, There's so much to learning theory and clicker training and positive reinforcement and associations and conditioning and all of that stuff. It's all very valuable and based in science and it's amazing. But I think that when it comes to horses and people, um, especially studying psychology, there's a lot of science on people and a lot of studies on people and there, there's direction to be found in that. And it gives you a starting point and um, some tools to use. But you cannot solve someone's problems um, in a therapeutic capacity by just adhering to studies. Um, There is an element that exists beyond it where you... There's just that human element that it, it's com- it's complex. And you, that relationship and the connection that goes farther than what are you associated with Um, like yes how do the people make you feel when you're around them like that exists obviously but that element of just intangible human connection also I believe exists with animals and horses are really really special in that way and it's just a feeling I get when I'm around her and obviously I, I'm probably biased in some way, um, but it just feels like like we did what we needed to do, and she changed my life in so many ways and absolutely turned my world upside down, um, changed my perspective, and gave me a path, um, and at least in some capacity, trying to make a positive difference in the world and in the horse world. 
and she's just like she's just good and I'm good with that you know I don't know if this makes any sense to anyone else it might be something that you would have to experience or maybe you have and please validate me if you have sorry I have to pop the neck um uh because I need it uh that it's just it's so different because especially now that I really have Azula to compare it with um, what I started to say earlier and then got sidetracked is that I have worked with Azula about the same amount that I have Zoe and it does not matter what I'm wearing what I'm doing or where I'm going uh, for instance I had to ride my boss's horse six uh, while she was on spring break and, and without a doubt every single time I went into out into that field it's a big big field um six would usually be on the opposite side of the field from azula and she would see me and immediately start walking and she's like what are we doing what are you doing hi and she just doesn't leave my side when i'm there and we have gone on walks in the field together and i'll just stand there and scratch her or exist with her and she is just into it whereas zoe like it's it's obvious to me that she's like okay we spent our time move along and with azula she's like i'm cool to hang out with you or we could do something you know and um just she's always a very willing participant and it's it's new with azula and like i said i could talk about it forever and i'm trying not to get super deep into it but um azula and i that relationship feels like neither of us had a choice and that we are just connected in a way that is truly inexplicable. I have no idea how to put it into words. And it's just, I I get her and she gets me in a way that I didn't really know was possible because a lot, like the horses that I've had in, in my past have been relationships that formed out of necessity or out of convenience or out of like you know me wanting to move up in the eventing world and from that grew a bond and a relationship and a partnership um and I love them all and I cherish them all in different ways and in similar ways but with Azula it was like it truly feels like what people talk about with heart horses and I really thought that I understood that um with Zoe and it, it it feels like a major betrayal to say that Zoe might not be my heart horse, but, um, Azula, like she feels like a friend, like, and Zoe has always felt kind of like a business partner in some way. I love Zoe to the ends of the earth, but that relationship is very different than what I have with Azula. Like Azula can't offer me anything right now. Like I can't ride her. I can't show her. I can't compete her. She's two years old. Um, We do a bunch of really boring stuff like picking up her feet or haltering. Um, But I just, it just feels so different than anything else. And I've worked with the other babies and arguably the cooler, you know, warm blood like Dexter is, he, we have sticked him on level ground and he is two years old as of last month and he has 17 hands. And he's this big, gorgeous, warm blood. And Astro's the same. And I just don't have that feeling with them that I do with Azula. And it's just crazy because she I thought she was hideous when I first met her. I actually asked my boss if we could get a different one of the other fillies that was there. And she was like, no, they don't want to get rid of that one. They want to get rid of her and her mom. And um, so we took them on. And I just absolutely fell in love with her. I couldn't help it. And every time I have tried to put her out of my mind or think that like, you know, I don't need to be acquiring horses at this stage in my life. Um, She needs to go be a racehorse and I won't have a say in it. I can't prevent it. It just is what it is. And I, at the time, I didn't think that I could just outright buy her, but then I did. Um, But it's just, it's such a different situation. And it's like, I just couldn't help it. We are just connected in this very unique powerful way and I wouldn't trade it for the world even though it is posing quite a large inconvenience in my life financially and future plan wise um which I'm sure I'll talk about at a later date but um there's a lot going on on the personal front but um yeah so I'm looking at my my plan here 
And I, I think I've just about covered everything that I wanted to for this first episode, and it's getting quite long. Um, but all that to say that a lot has changed, and it has really made me reflect on my life and what I want and my relationships and how I'm treating other people and other animals and how horses fit into my life now. And with the professionalism thing that I still am not sure that I ever finished my thought on, that I want horses to be something that I want to do. Because my relationship with horses has always felt sacred in some way. Like it, it's my, my passion. It's not my job. It's not my career. It's not a have to like school or work or things like that. It is my like safe space. Horses have always been where I felt safe. I felt confident, something that I wanted to do, that I was good at, that I enjoyed. And um, they have not been that for me lately. And it's part environment and part my fault and just how life goes. And I think realizing that my priorities had kind of gotten discombobulated. And so with that, I have reduced my role as a professional horse trainer. I don't really want to do the whole client thing right now, at least. Um, I think that maybe someday in the future, that is something that I would love to pursue. And I still might get my behavior consultant um, certification and practice that and do that on an online capacity or in a local capacity. But as far as training goes, I really want to sort of scale it back to where I'm prioritizing my horses and my relationship with them and my like, you know, satisfaction and my love for it again, because I really, really lost that. And that is heartbreaking to me. And it, it is not at all the same as, you know, like I lost my drive and motivation for social media. I'm like, okay, whatever that, that can come or go. But, um, with horses, it's just, it's, it is a part of me down to the fiber of my being and I refuse to give it up. And, uh, there's only one way to make that come back. And that is to find the love and passion for it again, by doing it authentically and from a genuine place of want and desire for that connection and care for the animal. And so that's, that's where I'm at with it and where I'm taking things. So what that means for the podcast and for you lovely people is that the pretty much at the moment, unless, you know, it's the right circumstance, um, I, I may or may not open on my website the behavior consulting service at some point, and I'll let you guys know when that's open. Currently, I have, I have the webpage completely finished for training and behavior consulting, um, but it's private. You Like the public can't see it. Um, and I was wondering why I kept not making it public. And it's because I don't really think that's what I want to be doing right now and where I want my focus to be. I want my focus to be on my horses, my relationship, my school, and the podcast. That is what I'm doing. And also myself and like prioritizing self-care and all of that. Um, but like, I just don't feel ready for it. And I don't feel like super good about over promising. And it's very stressful for me. Um, and there are other people that are absolutely amazing at it and are very well qualified for it. Um, like I know Adele Shaw at the Willing Equine, she does a lot of online training and she is phenomenal at it. And it's just like, I don't, I don't have to have my fingers in every single pie. You know what I mean? I don't have to do it just because I, I know that I can and I could, and I might someday. And I, I really think that it's something that I'm good at and I enjoy, but it's too much right now. I have so much happening. So for right now, keeping it to behavior consulting, um, on the Patreon and discussing things here on the podcast. But, um, you know, it's, I just, I want to roll back on the professionalism thing because I started this podcast to, to share my thoughts, ideas, opinions, and the things that I'm learning and to help make it more accessible for other equestrians to learn with me and to just be an honest journey that's relatable and that you can like find solace in and um, not something that's so like 
dogmatic and just this is the way and I know this to be true and you know the thing is I it feels like my training philosophy and my outlook on horses and relationships um, with them has just it's always changing it was very traditional for a very long time but then it was like you know this new door opened that all of a sudden there's positive reinforcement and I can train differently oh my god so I dove headfirst into it and then I got very puristy and very like dogmatic about it. And then um, over time, I was like, maybe not so much. Like, and maybe it doesn't have to be so rigidly black and white. Like, it is operant conditioning. I am a clicker trainer. I only do positive reinforcement. Um, and I think that there are a lot of trainers out there that offer that and that are very, very good at it. And while that is the way that I prefer to train, I don't think that is all there is to training and working with horses. Um, and it's something that makes me nervous to say because I feel like any of my positive reinforcement pals that might be listening to this are like, no, Jill, don't do that. I promise you, I'm not going back to traditional things. Um, that doesn't interest me in the slightest. Like I could give a rat's patonky. Is that a word? Probably not. Uh, about showing or competing or like jumping high anymore. Um, it's not really like something I'm super into anymore. Um, but I, I'm i more interested in the relationship aspect of horsemanship and how to make it something um, or how to honor it in a way that is authentic and stays true to the, the nature of that relationship. Because um, I think that regardless of what training method you use, you can go too far in <laughs> any direction. And for me, going strictly, strictly, strictly positive reinforcement um, and like only operating within the confines of like, I need to make a shaping plan for literally every behavior. I can't touch my horse without understanding, you know, the shaping plan and what I'm asking in training. And like, while it's useful to have that for training sessions, um, it, it makes it very mechanical, I think. And I'm sure there are ways to do it exclusively positive reinforcement and still have that. But, um, you know, I, I want to find the balance and, uh, not, not in the sense that I'm interested in balanced training either, but I, I want science-based relationship-based horsemanship. So, something that stays true and respectful to science and learning theory and how organisms and beings actually learn and understand and perceive the world around them. Something that, you know, honors that and um, does things in a low stress threshold, non-escalating way um, and keeps it to where the horses are interested and they enjoy it and they are voluntarily participating but also in a way that I'm not just being, you know, sort of a computer input X and get X and then just, it, it, it just makes it feel very rigid. And so I, I'm kind of like finding my way. And that is a really big reason that I want to take a step back from being a professional and a trainer because it, I, I'm still finding my way with horses and what I want to do. And I, I might be doing that forever, but that is the original reason that I started this podcast. And I started sharing my journey with horses because I wanted to share my journey with horses and where I'm at and what I'm learning and what I think and what I feel about this. And to present to other people that there are new ways of looking at things and it might not be the way that you want to go about it, but now you know, and you can explore that. And if it doesn't work for you, try something else. And that's kind of where I'm at with um, where I'm going, like still predominantly positive reinforcement based. I love it. I believe in it. It makes things go so well. And I feel, find myself smiling the whole time I'm training. Um, but I, I want to be able to sort of still have that communication aspect that I think a lot of people get turned off of positive reinforcement because of that, like it feels more normal to communicate and pressure and release with horses, mostly because that's the way that we're all brought up in the horse world, but also you don't have to stop and give treats every time. But I've sort of found this outside realm 
of it, if you will. Like there's traditional training and you're working towards goals and, or you're riding for pleasure and it's just, you know, pressure, release, negative reinforcement, traditional type. Um, and then there is positive reinforcement, clicker training, and you are doing a lot of basic and care type behaviors. And then you get to the riding and you get to do all of this really amazing stuff with your horse. There's also a lot of trick training that's really cool and really fun. And like, there are good sides to both of them, but then there's those moments where you're in the field with the horse and for no particular reason at all, they're going on a walk with you. And you're not giving them anything other than companionship and maybe something interesting to sniff. Um, And it's just, they're just there. And you're like, why are you following me? I'm not offering you anything. And I'm not forcing you or pressuring you in any capacity to do this. And you have realized that I don't have food and I'm not going to sit here and be your scratching post. Why are you still hanging with me? And that is the area that I'm really, really fascinated in uh, or about at the moment. And so finding a way to use that element and like really look at it and evaluate it and combine it with the positive reinforcement that's just like that relationship aspect in addition to the training. And um, yeah, so that's that's a weird spiel. And I hope that I'm not making a bunch of people nervous or like hopeful that I'm coming back to traditional. That's not on the table. Um, and I'm not going full purist and I haven't been for a long time. And those of you that are on the discord, um, you know, that I have pulled back from that a lot. I'm still more than happy to educate people on positive reinforcement and help you work that out and explore topics and ways to approach situations from positive reinforcement standpoint. But for me personally, in my work with my horses, I, I, I want to explore a little bit more before I fully settle and be like, I am this, you know? And I feel like I've been staking my flag, my proverbial flag a little too quickly lately. So that's why that's, that's a big reason that I'm pulling back from the professional stuff, because I don't really feel settled in what I'm doing. And I don't think that any professional really is like, feels like they fully know everything. And I wouldn't expect that. But I, I feel a little bit more in limbo than I would like to, in order to be offering ways that other people might work with their horses, if that makes sense. So scaling back to I'm sharing my journey, my thoughts, my opinions, my adventure, and um, discussing what I'm learning and what I'm doing rather than so much trying to teach element because I very much still feel like I'm learning. And that might be a little bit of imposter syndrome, or it might be recognizing some Dunning, Dunning Kruger, Dunning Kruger, Dunning, Uh, right? Okay. Anyway, um, (laughs) So yeah, well, there's just a new focus. And I think that all comes with growing up and maturing in the horse world and learning more things. And all of this has come about from me growing up and maturing and evolving as a person. I'm like so close to having a prefrontal cortex that's fully developed. I got like a year and a half left. Um, so less than actually, I think maybe I can't count right now. I'm talking. Okay. Don't expect that from me. Um, but Yeah. So I'm just, I'm scaling back. I'm trying to make it manageable and something that I can still enjoy. And that makes me put out more (laughs) and be more productive, if you will. Um, So that's life hack. Uh, You know, if you find you're not being productive anymore, figure out how you can make yourself like gaslight yourself into wanting to do it. (laughs) Um, I'm just kidding. It's authentic. I'm not gaslighting myself. Um, But yeah. So just all of that evaluating has kind of come to this final conclusion. So yeah, I'm, I think that's, that's about all I need to say for this episode. Um, I feel like I finally got all of that off my chest and this is actually the second time that I filmed this episode because the first time I just, it, it was not the vibe, you know? Um, but I hope that you guys enjoyed it and you're interested in the newer direction. It, it'll be a lot similar to what it has been, um, you know, mostly just me riffing, talking about different horsey things. Um, I hope that maybe I'll do some reaction type content. To, a lot of people wanted me to react to my old videos and like analyze the horses and my training and the things that I said. And I think that could be really cool once I figure out how to film on this and watch something and react to it all at the same time. 
Um, I don't think it's that difficult, but it is a lot for my brain. And I was like, let's just, let's start here. So, um, that's, that's that. I hope you guys are excited and are glad that the podcast is back. I, when I posted that the rebrand was done and I was bringing the podcast back this week, the, like, I usually get like two comments on Instagram post somewhere around there, maybe 10 if I'm lucky. And the love and support on that podcast just meant so much to me. And I was like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. Like it, it means like, I'm going to get cheesy. It means so much to me that this podcast means so much to some of you. The fact that some of you were commenting, like, this is my favorite podcast. I've missed it so much. Like that means the world to me. Um, because I just feel like I'm a, a goofy 20 year old. That's a horse obsessed. And trying to figure out how to exist in this world um, in an authentic way that makes me happy. And like, it just feels like I'm, I'm guessing all of the time and that I don't know that people actually enjoy this. So it really means a lot to me to see that and reading the reviews that you guys write on iTunes. And I think Spotify does it now too, a quick plug. Um, and just like seeing that, it means so much. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's not just me. It, it means something to other people too. So, and I think that that's, that's the most fulfilling thing in life or things in life that when you can find something that brings you joy and brings other people joy, like it's the best of both worlds and hopefully it'll bring some horses some joy too. So, um, I hope that this podcast is entertaining and that you guys are down for it. Um, and if you have something that you want to see, you want me to talk about, uh, please feel free to comment it below. Uh, like I said, the training capacity, not so much. I might take some questions here and there, um, obviously prioritizing patrons. So if you want to join that discord server, you'll have access to that and you can vote on topics and stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily comment like my horse does X, Y, and Z and I've tried X, Y, and Z. How can I fix it? Um, because a, I guarantee you there's probably already an equity theory podcast episode covering it. And B, um, I tried answering every single person's question and training advice column and it got very overwhelming <laughs> and also very repetitive. And I think people got tired of it. So, um, you know, I want to keep it a little, a little looser. Maybe I'll introduce a segment in the future where I'm like, let's take a, you know, an audience member question and I'll work through it. You know, that might be a segment that I can introduce on the podcast, um, it just, it opened the floodgates of me unintentionally being forced to let people down because I physically could not answer every single question that I was getting. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, you can also check out the equitheory.com and on the positive reinforcement page, there is a trainer map. So you can physically look at a map of positive reinforcement or clicker trainers, um, and see if there's one near you. It is a global map. Um, obviously, the U.S. is going to be the more populated map, but there are trainers all around the world, and they are listed to the best of the group's ability. Um, so, you know, give that give that a check out. And um, yeah, I think that's going to be it. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you're listening or watching. Um, let me know if you like the videos, because this is going to be a lot more effort, I think. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it. It really feels good to be back and to be doing this like this, this feels like my bread and butter. And I really, I just enjoy the podcast, even though my throat is killing me because I couldn't tell you the last time I talked for this long. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to stop saying, um, yeah, but um, yeah, and I'm going to let you guys go. Please leave a rating review comment. Let me know if you like it. Follow Jet Equitheory on all of your favorite social platforms, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Did I say Twitter? Also, the Equitheory podcast has an Instagram. I'm not sure if I'll just, you know, kick it on over to Jet Equitheory or not, but we'll see. I hope that you guys enjoyed it and have a wonderful day, a wonderful week. Enjoy your ponies, explore your relationship, evaluate your life and the things, and I will catch you guys in the next one.